welcome to the inaugural Idaho 97 Crew podcast or podcast like broadcast. Uh, I'm Nathaniel Hoffman, one of the co-founders of Idaho 97, here with Emily Walton, a fellow co-founder, uh, Mike Setz, our director in Boise, and Alicia Abbott, live from her car. Where are you, Alicia? I am in rural America right now, Nate. You know, uh, we, we don't stop just in Boise. We're all over. Okay, you don't have to be specific. That's cool. Uh, we're gonna just in a very like secret, head. secret and undisclosed rural location. That's how Alicia rolls. Uh, we are gonna have a casual conversation here, just for about 20 to 30 minutes, about uh, what's going on in the state of Idaho uh, and with the state of Idaho. And I want to just get started real quick because. Only a week ago on Friday, our Lieutenant Governor appeared at a, uh, basically a white nationalist conference in Florida. And we saw it on Twitter first. It's been quite a ride since then. Uh, who wants to jump in on Halfpack and Lieutenant Governor McGeehan? I would love to. <laughs> jump, Mike. So Halfpack is the America First Pack. A um, little history on America First, the America First movement. The America First movement actually first started uh, prior to World War II. Um, and the America First movement was closely affiliated with the American Nazi Party. Um, and, and that was the, the entire uh, premise of it. Um, and, and so it's no accident that uh, that name was picked today. Um, and that's the name that we have. And so so America First Pack actually started uh, when they broke off from what's that other other very conservative pack group called? Um, um, I'm forgetting the name of it, uh, but they, they broke off from CPAC, right? They broke off from CPAC that everybody thought was like as conservative as you can be, and then maybe going a little too far or a lot too far. Um, but the AFPAC folks <laughs> thought you're not going in far enough. Um, and so uh, it, it started off uh, that way. Uh, the SAF pack was run by a man named Nick Fuentes, who is an absolute unapologetic uh, white nationalist. Um, and uh, that's who spoke at this event. And that's what this event is known for. This event is known as uh, the white nationalist uh, movements of um, uh, political event of the year. Um, and uh, so it was kind of shocking uh, that Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan of Idaho um, was one of the secret guests who appeared via video uh, there. Um, but that's kind of a little bit of the background of, of the group um, and uh, why we're so shocked that uh, someone who is going to be in the non-Idaho way would go there. So uh, what happened, like what's been the fallout in Idaho since uh, since she spoke at that halfback uh, conference last week? Well, she's had a few interviews on television. Brian Holmes at KTVB stopped her in the hallway um, for the 208 program and asked her some questions about her involvement in AFPAC. Um, needless to say, she dodged most questions and um, I find this very unnerving. I wouldn't say it was her finest moment on screen. I wouldn't even say she dodged, right? She was, she was evasive. Right. And if anyone wants to look that up, just go to kpvb.com and, and hit the link for the 208 and you can see the video of it right there. What did you take away from that, Emily? Yeah, I, I think, you know, just as a person who's run a lot of campaigns and advised a lot of people for running for office, you know, first of all, don't be a white supremacist. But second, like <laughs> just, it just really demonstrated how absolutely unprepared she is to be governor. You know, the fact that you would go and send a video in and then be like, I didn't really know who they were. Oh, OK, don't ever do that. And then just taking a random you know, interview in the hall and not being prepared and then stumbling so poorly for three minutes. It was painful to watch as a person who's run campaigns and uh, you know, just clearly demonstrated she does not have the moral capacity to lead and neither does she have any of the capacity to just lead in general because she just doesn't know how to manage things. If you don't know who you're sending videos to, first of all, terrible excuse, you did know, but I mean, just what, what terrible leadership. We're going to come back to this at the end for a special segment that we have for y'all. But uh, let's talk about, you know, one of our main focuses is uh, specific things that are happening in the legislature and specifically uh, that the extremist caucus and the Freedom Foundation, I got to put that in air quotes, Freedom Foundation, uh, legislators 
are bringing forward. So uh, can we go over some of those that we have been tracking this week? Uh, and I'd like to start with the voter suppression bills. There's quite a few efforts to make it harder to vote in Idaho. Um, who wants to take a stab at the uh, legislative think, voter uh, suppression? Uh, Alicia is our, our, our point person there. And also my little selfish thing is she knows all the bill numbers. That's right. <laughs> So, Alicia, can we have the numbers and the names, please? You bet. Um, you know, we've got a handful of voter suppression bills that are on the table right now, uh, mostly getting ready to be heard on the House floor and some headed to Senate committees. One of them is House Bill 439. This would change the unaffiliated voter uh, deadline. So if you were our traditional voter who affiliates and chooses a ballot on election day, if this bill passes, you would no longer be eligible to get your GOP ballot. HB 439, um, that one is currently on its way to the Senate State Affairs Committee. And, um, and, we and have, the, the unofficial name of, of HB 439 is the Doug Okunowitz Primary Voter Registration Disenfranchisement Bill. <laughs> that's what we've decided what to call it. I like that. Um, that's very appropriate. Um, Doug is a legislator from North Idaho, and um, I don't think uh, the folks in his area are particularly fond of this bill, as we at the Idaho 97 have been calling into Kootenai County to warn those folks that their traditional voting rights might be changed. So um, we got to keep our eyes and ears open for a committee hearing in the Senate State Affairs. And if you're available, please consider giving testimony for that. Um, this, this week, we heard some, uh, had hearings for two bills, uh, House Bill 692 and House Bill 693. 693 is, is, is the Priscilla Giddings voting drop box removal bill. So HB yeah, 692 is the called the Dorothy Moon Monster Voter Suppression Bill. This does all kinds of things, restricts um, voter IDs, makes us so you got to get a birth certificate makes it so that folks who are serving their country from Idaho overseas who are in the military makes it harder for them to vote, a bunch of ridiculous things. And then the Priscilla Giddings voting drop box removal bill takes uh, control and um, decision making out of local hands of local county clerks, makes it so that there can't be any drop boxes. Ridiculous. There's no reason for there to not be drop boxes in Idaho. They're a perfectly fine way to drop off an absentee ballot and vote. And so we don't like these yeah. bills at all. And, and, and I've got to say, you know, uh, specifically this Priscilla Giddings uh, uh, bill, you know, Priscilla Giddings, um, she, she runs on a brand uh, associated with her military service. And, and I don't know if everybody out there in, in the land watching this knows, but, but I'm a veteran and, and lots of Idaho 97 percenters are veterans. Um, and, and I go to the, the VA uh, quite frequently, <laughs> unfortunately, um, and I see a lot of really disabled veterans. And, and one thing that, that one of our followers really complained about loudly was his father, who was a World War II vet. Um, and, and I love the stories he tells about his father because I was on an LST when I was in the Navy and his dad was on an LST when he was in the Navy. Um, and, 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 but his father has actually given up on voting. My 95 year old man has said, I'm just giving up on voting because they're making it too hard. Um, and that's out in, in, in Eastern Idaho. Um, and, and, and really uh, Priscilla Giddings should be absolutely ashamed of, of that, right? Of, of what she's doing to our older veterans, to our, to our people who are serving in the military. Um, and, and she should never ever show up with that stupid 30 millimeter um, A-10 uh, shell that she always walks around with. Um, because because she has absolutely broken the faith uh, with, with with our veterans uh, with this bill. It's it's really astonishing. Yeah, right on. Hey, what's an LST, Mike? Uh, it's a, a tank landing ship, or or depending on your perspective, uh, they also used to call them long, slow targets. Uh, yeah. So you know, really, we were we were a one way trip uh, typically, is what we were told. So. Uh, we're going to keep this going. Uh, you know, I know 97 is super focused on, you know, fixing these problems. So we're not just going to give you these bill numbers in a few minutes. We're going to talk about what you can do about them. But first, I just want to go over two or three more things. Uh, we had a victory in the House, I believe. Uh, was it in the House committee? 
uh, on school vouchers this week. And uh, Mike, why don't you tell us what happened there? Yeah, um, school vouchers was at the six ninety nine. Is that right? I got that number right. I, I think no one's no way. Yeah, we're all looking around like I don't know. But anyway, so the school voucher bill right, was essentially a bill that was that's, that we've seen uh, Alec and other allied organizations pushing throughout states across the country. Um, and, and, and what it is, is it basically uh, they call it school choice. But really well, what it does, is it, 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 it takes it robs the public coffers. Right. It takes our tax dollars and gives it to uh, private schools and religious schools. Um, and, and in particular, what was really bad about this bill is is they try to play um, urban and rural Idaho off of each other. But really, um, it, it, this bill would have been just extremely damaging to our rural schools. Um, there's just no markets. Uh, there's not enough people uh, uh, to do this. And this would have just really harmed our students out there. Um, and, and, and what happened was we were part of this giant coalition that included groups like Idaho Business for Education. Um, uh, there were other groups out there that, that were working really hard. We got parents to show up, PTA uh, parents showed up. Uh, people testified locally, remotely, in writing. Um, and in fact, I believe, uh, um, oh, I just got corrected, it's House Bill 669. Um, so uh, that was uh, defeated. And, and in fact, they had to, to carry the hearing over to a second day uh, because there was so much interest in this. And, and ultimately, uh, the, the bill went down. It was held in committee on a motion, uh, which um, hopefully, as long as they don't go back to it for all intents and purposes, kills it, um, eight to seven, right? So it was just one vote uh, that did that. And, and a huge thank you to our legislators who listened to Idahoans um, and listened to their concerns, um, because this is a, a wildly unpopular bill that's being pushed by, like I said, these outside interests, the Idaho Freedom Foundation, uh, the John Burt Society and some other organizations. Um, but, but that was a huge victory. And, and, and one of the things that, that shows what a huge victory it was, was every group that's involved in education is, 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 oh, we can't possibly win in the house. The house is lost. We can't win it there. But here we are. We realized we had a chance to win and we all jumped in and worked together um, and we stopped this bill in the house, um, which also shows uh, that uh, some of the extremist influence, not all of it, you've heard these other bills, you'll also hear some more, but some of it is not as strong as it was uh, last year. You know, it's just such a gross miscalculation too, because every single poll out there shows that Idahoans love uh, their schools, their local schools, their local school districts. We know that as a fact. I don't really understand why there's a constant attack on education. Anybody have any ideas? Uh, because People like us need to do more work to create incentives to discourage them, just like we're doing. Yeah, yeah. You know, right. We have to be louder, put their own voters in front of them, talking about how bad it is. I will tell you, though, you know, Alicia and I were considering starting a witch school, and now we're not going to get funding for that, and I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> well, you can always start it, but you'll just be a very low budget. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, I will tell you um, this this whole voucher movement, right? It's it's pushed by a group that was started by Nancy DeVos um, and, and, and other groups that are related to, to the foundations, the Koch brothers uh, push in this state. It's being pushed by the Idaho Freedom Foundation um, and the Idaho Freedom Foundation's leader. Um, uh, Wayne Hoffman has come out. He's on record uh, saying he, he wants, he doesn't think there should be a public schools, uh, publicly funded schools in Idaho. Um, and, and that's exactly what this would do. It would, would just kill, it would do, it would just destroy our public education. That's the real goal behind these bills. The real goal is to get rid of public education and uh, to have some of these folks get rich off of um, uh, uh, government funding of private education and religious education. Uh, that, right. that, that is, it, that's at the heart of it. All right, two or three more items. The legislature is attacking more Idahoans, more groups of Idahoans, uh, including transgender children and actually librarians. I mean, where'd that going come from? Yeah, right. The criminalizing librarians, right? Yeah. And criminalizing physicians who want to give health care to trans youth. And these bills are really, uh, um, you know, they, they, they're both based on, um, it's, it's really sort of, gender superiority, right? And, and, and using gender is, is a weapon um, and gender identity is a weapon. Um, and, and that's a common theme that we see happening throughout uh, um, extremist movements um, and, and, and extremism in general, right? Um, and, and, and so when you look at the transgender youth bill, right? Um, well, this is a group that is, is, is extremely vulnerable in our society right now. 
and 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 but they, they don't have a lot of support because a lot of people don't understand it um they don't understand the concepts and 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 that kind of thing so it's an easy group to pick on right the librarian bill right well that's focused on um you know, you know, basically sex, right? Sexuality, right? It's focused on, uh, you know, saying, oh, you're, you're, you're giving our, our, our students these, these awful horrendous bills that are, you're teaching them porn and, and all of this, this awful stuff. Um, and again, it's focused again around sexuality, sex and gender, right? Um, which one makes you wonder like, why do you guys always look at this stuff so much? Uh, but um, mm -hmm. that's, that's, uh, <laughs> I can see, see people thinking about that right now. Um, but um, the other thing is, is, is the criminal nature uh, from the legal perspective, right? I mean, this is just, just ham, ham handed, heavy fisted uh, approach, right? Um, you know, it, it, clearly the librarian bill is criminalizing librarians, right? Because it refers to a criminal bill in the Idaho code, right? And then criminalizing doctors for providing medical care uh, uh, for trans youth, right? So, so it's very punitive, right? It's designed to terrorize uh, uh, both of these populations, really, right? And, and the entire families affiliated with these populations. And, and it's just an awful thing. And, and one other thing that I'll just throw out there about transgender youth in particular, um, this is a very fragile population. Uh, they, they, society doesn't understand them. Uh, they don't understand where they fit and they're trying to learn and find themselves. And, and, and this is a difficult time in, in, a, in a young person's life. Um, and when we, when we do these kind of things, um, this leads to 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 them uh, real spikes in self harm in this population, um, and everybody knows this, right? And that's one of the things that makes these bills just so nefarious because the people pushing these bills know exactly what is go or is going to happen, um, and, and they don't care. Um, and, and 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 so we should really stand against these bills, not because we agree or disagree or anything like that, but just because we don't like discrimination and we don't like hurting people. Right? That should be enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll add, you know, a common theme in both of these is really questioning um, parents and their decisions about their children. You know, I went to the library all the time as a kid, and it was just understood that it was my mom's job to figure out what I was reading or not reading, and that was left up to her, and that's fine. And it's the same thing with, you know, medical care for, for transgender children. It's parents' decisions how to deal with this, and we need to leave it up to them. And so it's so, I mean, it's, you know, we can do this for days, you know, point out the hypocrisy of people who bring these things forward, but it really kind of leads back to this idea of, you know, quote, parental rights for some people who we agree with and not for others who we don't. Mm -hmm. And and that's, it's just not okay. That's right. All right, so let's move to our next section here and let's tell folks uh, what, we're doing and what they can do to help out in fighting all of these uh, bad bills. And um, I think we should start again with voting because uh, the May 17th primary is quickly coming up. And there are things that Idahoans need to know if they're gonna successfully vote on May 17th. So uh, what do folks have to do to make sure that they are registered and affiliated, Alicia? We have a big day coming up, folks. It's just days away. That is March 11th. This could end up being the deadline for Idahoans to affiliate um, for a GOP primary ballot. So all the conservatives out there listening who traditionally pick up their GOP ballot on election day, please do it early this year. It might not be an option for you on election day this year. Um, Alicia, can we, uh, can we just simplify that a little more though? Because what, what do you mean by affiliate and why is that something that that we need to actually like check on and, and make happen. Yep, I was just gonna go into that. Um, traditionally you. in Idaho, if you're an independent, AKA an affiliated voter in our state, um, when you get a primary ballot, there are no candidates, only local issues. If you would like to weigh in on the candidates this primary, which is May 17th, you need to ensure that you're getting your ballot early this year, just in case some of these bad bills make it over the line, specifically House Bill 439. Um, the other bills are not attacking this privilege and right, um, but 439 is. And we want everybody to know um, that March 11th is the day that you should try to, you know, get plugged into a ballot with candidates. And I will add, you know, if you're a traditional person who chooses a Democratic ballot on Election Day, your your rights are not at risk right now. It is specifically targeting the closed primary of the GOP. 
Yeah. Uh, okay, so people can do that through the Idaho Secretary of State website. Uh, if you go to the voting section, election section, um, there's pretty clear path to check your voter registration, which will show you if you're affiliated or not. And if you're not, uh, there's a form you have to print up. It's a little complicated. Uh, I don't, is there a good place for people to get instructions, Alicia? If you go to voteidaho.gov, on the right side of the website, there will be instructions to print out your paper. Online registration and affiliation will again be available on March 9th, 10th, and 11th, according to the Idaho Secretary of State. Um, okay. But don't delay. Uh, if you don't want to put your uh, registration in the mail, you can drop it off at your local county elections office, and they are happy to assist you in those offices. Our county clerks are amazing all over Idaho. Okay, one more question that we keep getting from the audience. Uh, you, you can also request a absentee ballot, and there's some confusion about affiliation and absentee voting. Can, can you clear that up for us? Yeah, you know, Idaho's system is not user friendly. Um, so there is an entirely different process um, to voting at home. Um, you have to separately request your absentee ballot. Uh, you can do that also on the Idaho Secretary of State's website, voteidaho.gov. And the instructions are also clear, clearly on the landing page. Um, but yes, absentee ballot requests and affiliations are separate forms that you have to fill out. So you want to make sure that you have those requests in before any deadlines pop up on us. Right on. All right, let's go to Mike. Uh, Mike, we are asking people to write into their legislators right now, uh, mostly about this election stuff. How can people do that? What tell us about that? Yeah, so uh, we have an email tool that's up uh, that will make it easy uh, to write in. Uh, to your legislators. You can um, go to um, any of our, our uh, social media, uh, our main social media feeds, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and you can find uh, posts about it there or tweets about it. Um, you can also go to our website, which is the Idaho97.org. Um, and, and, and you can look, click under actions um, and, and you'll see that action there. Um, and what we've done, because there are so many of these bills attacking Idahoans' rights to vote, um, we put them all together, um, and and you can uh, you you put your information in, um, and then it figures out who your representatives are um, and your senators, um, and it, it'll it'll send the, the email to them. Uh, it just basically says, "Stop attacking our right to vote." <laughs> you know, this is uh, it's very simple, um, and, and that's the message. Um, it, it's actually too complicated to go after each one of these bills because there's so many, but the theme is the same. Uh, leave us alone. Um, it's it, it's it's really astonishing uh, that the Idaho legislature is doesn't want people to vote. Um, and that should tell people a lot about what's going on right now. Yeah. So the Idaho ninety seven project is a very online organization. Uh, you should follow us on Twitter if that's something that you use, a social media platform that you use at the Idaho ninety seven. Uh, we're also on Facebook at the Idaho ninety seven Instagram and TikTok, but there's not much there yet. Uh, maybe someday soon. Uh, are there other ways people can keep in touch that I'm missing? Uh, well, you can go to our, our website. I mean, you can sign up for our, our emails and our newsletters. Um, yeah. Now, now we're not like other groups. We don't send you three, three emails a day. Although right now, uh, because the session is getting really hot, uh, do expect weekly emails. And if an emergency comes up, we might send you one. Uh, but we're only sending emails uh, that are either updating you on what's going on or are telling you, hey, we, we've got to stand up for our rights and, and, and stand up against extremism. Uh, but, but you can fill out uh, your information there and you can sign up for our newsletter. Um, and, and honestly, that's the best way uh, to stay in touch because that's where you get the most information. Uh, but also it, we, we do encourage people to follow us on social media uh, because when things happen uh, and, and, and right now it's so crazy. I mean, just this week is a great example. I think we, what, we got five new bills that are just attacking Idahoans left and right. We put them out very quickly there and we can tell you what's going on uh, that way. Uh, so, so those are the ways to do it uh, and, and to stay in touch with us. All right, so we're going to close this out with a, another segment where we're going to look at uh, one Idaho extremist a week or however often we end up doing this. And uh, we've given a special moniker to this segment that I'm going to turn to Alicia to introduce the Idaho 97 projects. This is our weekly segment of My Far Right Nut. 
where we explore and examine one of our far right legislators um, and or lawmakers in Idaho. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yo, let's get stupid, y'all. Yo, old boy, you seen him? See, fool. My nuts, man. Who you think? Oh, oh forget it, forget it. Here they come now. Ooh, this ooh. week, we are going to do our inaugural segment for Janice McGeehan, who is now our lieutenant governor, but is a former legislator herself. Um, so we're going to dig into a little bit about Janice and um, who she affiliates with and uh, some of her activities. Um, well, does anybody want to start? I mean, she wants to be our governor, too. Like, she's running for governor. So. She's running for governor right now. That is a very good point. Um, so she's somebody who is going to be challenging Governor Brad Little in the May 17th primary. There are some other uh, candidates also in that primary that might split votes. So it's very important yeah. that conservatives show up this year. Well, this is what yeah. I want to say. You know, she she got called out for going to the to the uh, AFPEC, you know, white nationalist conference. But for us, that was not a surprise. Like that is a natural habitat for Janice McGeehan. Uh, anybody that has been watching her over the last couple of years uh, knows that, you know, she walks around with bodyguards who are not you know, state employees, they are from private, you know, unlawful militia groups that she affiliates with. So I don't know, I mean, Alicia, you follow this very closely. Do you want to say a little more about um, where Janice comes from? Um, Janice is, uh, you know, Janice has not always been this way. There was actually a great op-ed written earlier this week um, talking about how Janice used to be a run-of-the-mill conservative legislator for Idaho. And over the years, her affiliation to paramilitary private militia groups has um, gained uh, momentum, specifically with the three percenters and the Oath Keepers. Somebody who lives in my county um, is regularly on tour with Janice McGeehan as one of her bodyguard staff. Um, so I, I, I was one of those people who was not shocked that she joined AFPAC. Um, some of these paramilitary groups definitely have members that believe in white supremacy or Christian supremacy. So um, it was not a shock. Um, but in addition to these paramilitary groups, Janice is also uh, on tour with dark money groups on a regular basis. People like the Idaho Freedom Foundation, people like John Birch Society. Uh, Mike, I'd like for you to talk a little bit about the indoctrination tax task force. Um, I think that is kind of a, a really pivotal example of the type of white supremacy that Janice McGeehan is already bringing to the legislature, um, um, specifically anti-Semitism. Sure. Um, and, and just to, to quickly tap onto what you say, when, when, uh, when Janice McGeehan was roundly attacked by this, I mean, everybody who's legitimate in Idaho politics uh, has attacked her. Uh, uh, Mitt Romney even quoted uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and, and, and said, morons, I have morons on my team about, about her and these other people who, who showed up at this uh, AFPAC and spoke there. Um, but the people who came to her defense, it, it tells you all you need to know about her. Um, uh, David Riley, uh, who's, who's from uh, uh, in Kootenai County, who, who we helped defeat in his school board run, um, as an avowed uh, uh, anti-Semite, he said all kinds of anti-Semitic things. Um, and, and he has, uh, he actually uh, was a big supporter of the Charlottesville uh, white supremacist march uh, uh, that happened, uh, came to her defense uh, vocally. Um, and, and so, you know, that, that tells you kind of what you need to know about who these AFPAC folks are and, and who Janice McGeehan is. But Janice McGeehan, uh, you know, she, she was known for, she, she did this political stunt, this, this indoctrination task force, um, which, which was uh, ostensibly supposed to look for it. Uh, CRT, critical race uh, uh, studies, um, um, indoctrination in our schools, but was really trying to indoctrinate us um, in, in this extremist viewpoint. Um, and, you know, we had, um, we had all of these extremists. It was a hand-picked group. Um, it sure seemed like it was managed by uh, the Idaho Freedom Foundation. The Idaho Freedom Foundation had one of their people on it. Um, uh, and, and, you know, it had that extremist uh, professor from BSU uh, on it as well, um, and, and and they went on what was an actual Salem witch hunt. Um, they said CRT was in all of our schools. Uh, they went and looked, um, couldn't find it anywhere. 
right? And and uh, they, they said CRT was being forced down the throats of our students in, in higher education. They went and looked, couldn't find it anywhere. The State Board of Education couldn't find it. They couldn't find it. Nobody could find it, right? But the whole idea was just to divide people, right? It was to, it was to use race as a, as a tool to divide people. Um, and, and the thing is, they were using race by saying, um, they're being racist against us, white people, when it was really this whole panel of white people that was being racist against everybody else. Um, now, I have been all over the state. I have been, been in all sectors of the state. I've talked to educators in every part of the state. None of them teach it, right? And, and they're actually very upset because they, they're cutting their budgets, they're threatening their budgets based on what is, in essence, a lie. Right. And they can't provide any proof. And the latest thing that happened was was Representative Dorothy Moon uh, 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 alluded to CRT being taught. And I think it was was it Idaho County. Um, I, I think uh, it was where, Boise what, County or Boise County. Right. Um, and and, um, you know, the, the, the school district came up and said, no, we weren't we're not doing this. This didn't happen. Right. Uh, one of the reps sitting next to her just shook her head like you're not telling the truth. Um, and then. Uh, we actually sent in, Alicia actually sent in a public records request saying, hey, show us the proof. Um, and we got the response that said, there is no proof. Uh, and and, and that, that tells you what you need to know about, about what they're trying to do. But this is all a political stunt to try and motivate uh, hateful uh, uh, portions of our society and try to divide the rest of us. Um, and, and that's exactly uh, the tactic and strategy uh, that's being employed. And now she's trying to do an anti-Semitism task force um, when she just spoke at a convention that was full of anti-Semites. Um, and, and, and now she, she, she tried to recruit a, a rabbi who's down here in the Boise area. And he just did a fabulous job. He, he said, you're, you're not being serious. Essentially, he said, you're not being serious. And how I know you're not being serious is you're associating with these white supremacists who are the people that we see as the biggest danger to us as, as Jews, basically. Um, and, uh, but that just shows you how, how unserious she is and how, how much she's really about playing political theater, um, uh, but, but not really about bringing us together. Uh, she's, I, I think uh, uh, the best person who, who has this is Emily. I, I, if you could talk about your, your builders and your, your breakers, right? The people who build things and the people who break things and how uh, yeah. Janet McGeehan falls into that, that world. Yeah, this is something extremists do all over. I mean, if you really look at like Idaho Freedom Foundation, they do the same thing. You know, it's really easy to walk in anywhere and point out things that you don't like, tear things apart, talk about, you know, how public education isn't what I want it to be. So we're just going to take away all public education and, you know, empty the schools, we're done. And it's so much harder to build something. It's so much harder to come in and be an Idahoan who comes in and build something that works for people and make it keep working. And those are the people that we want to lift up their voices and make sure they're being heard in Idaho, right? Our teachers, our librarians, our nurses, our doctors, people around the state building the state, people out there building the roads, people who are here to build something and make it better and not tear it down. And so I think, you know, pay attention to people who walk in and just say everything's terrible terrible, we're going to burn it all down because they don't know how to build things. They don't know how to go in and make something good. They don't have practice in that in their life. And that's dangerous. I don't really want to live in a society where there's just people running around with a blowtorch. That's not going to work. Yeah. And that's all of you. That That's why we call ourselves the 97% because everyone out there in Idaho who is, you know, like providing for their family and being creative in their daily work and their daily life, you are the majority of the folks in this state and uh that's who we're here to serve so reach out uh let us know what you're concerned about let us know what you want to hear from us and uh thank you that was fun it was good to see all of you and um i think that is a wrap <laughs> <laughs>